today's lecture on dubiification. This would be a, a lecture with a difference um, compared to others you've received in this unit. Uh, a warning first up, I did my PhD on Dubai, so you, you've got to watch out. Um, we may get lost in detail, let's hope not. Uh, I also lived there for a while, so it's an area of you know, real personal interest. Four parts the lecture will be in. Uh, introduction, then I'll take you for a walking or more likely a driving tour of Dubai's main urbanisms. Uh, we'll venture a critique and we'll look to the locations uh, where Dubaiification is being exported. All right. So firstly, an introduction to Dubai. Um, it, it is, people don't talk about the biophysical component of Dubai, but it's really interesting. It's, it sits on the edge of the empty quarter, which is a huge desert. In Arabic, it's called the Rab al Khali Desert. Um, it has giant sand dunes uh, down in Liwa, which is on the edge of Saudi Arabia, I think. They're like 300 meters tall. It is beautiful and amazing and, and apparently endless. Uh, it, it doesn't rain there for years. It'll, you know, sections of the desert will go without rain for years. So greenery is hugely meaningful and significant in that hyper-arid context. Where this washes up on the edge of the Arabian Gulf or the Persian Gulf, depending on your, your leaning, um, you tend to get a subka, which is the Arab word for salt marsh. So it's not just a sand pit. It, it's often designers and people who go there and build stuff in Dubai tend to overlook its, um, the strong biophysical, biophysical dimension of it. Uh, it is hyper-arid, it's hyper-saline in, in points. It's quite beautiful too, but it's you know, perceived as a giant sand pit. Okay, so that's the, the biophysical component of Dubai. Um, the settlement is actually really ancient. You don't hear about that, but it's been a, it, was a, it was a kind of um, a smuggling and, 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 and trading port um, for thousands of years. Uh, and it was run by you know, the various tribes throughout that region of nations which now make up the UAE or the United Arab Emirates, which is the only confederation of Arab states in the world. This is Sheikh Mohammed. Uh, he, he is the benevolent dictator of Dubai. He's extraordinarily wealthy. Um, and his rule is maintained by what is referred to as the ruling bargain, which is that um, for loyalty, the loyalty of his citizens and his subjects, for that, uh, he bestows upon them what has historically been free housing and dispersing oil money and, you know, and economic wealth. So that's been the kind of, that's kind of been the deal. It's called the, the ruling bargain. So it's an interesting place, I think, both in terms of its extreme uh, land, biophysical landscape and, and climate, super hot, super dry, very humid, funnily enough. And, it, you know, the supreme power of Sheikh Mohammed uh, and huge, huge wealth that goes with that. So it's an extreme context to be working within. It's also interesting in the sense that it's like there's no division between state and industry, right? So Sheikh Mohammed, Dubai's ruler, he, he is a major part in, in, in a whole number of really huge development companies in Dubai, right? So he's, it's, it's both like he's both in business and he's in government. So in a sense, I guess he's controlling the work of the government departments to some point, but also the master developers and ones like Maydan, his um, personal sort of, you know, um, property, and hugely involved in them. Uh, and they're very big de development companies who work in Dubai, but now increasingly across the world. Um, beneath them, you have the urban professions, Mostly they involve Western companies, but you know, not, not exclusively. Companies like Acom or Atkins, uh, you know, architects, urban designers, planners, landscape architects, who have a foot on the ground in, in the Middle East and in Dubai and often have offices elsewhere in the West. Um, then you have the huge construction companies, uh, which are normally lo owned by um, local uh, Emiratis, and, and underneath them, uh, you have the migrant labourers, huge numbers of unskilled, uh, technically unskilled migrant labourers who are shipped in from around the world, often India, Pakistan, to some degree China now, Philippines, and they work in tremendous heat and terrible conditions. 
building these mega projects for the master developers. So it's an extremely hierarchical development model, development system, which de delivers, you know, these mega projects in Dubai. I mean, they're vast scale projects. Uh, it's a wonderful place to work if you ever get the chance, but, you know, it, it raises all kinds of conundrums, particularly around the rights of the migrant labourers and their working conditions. Um, and also, I guess it's very different, unfamiliar to a lot of us in the sense that there's this complete entanglement of the public and private. Uh, Sheikh Mohammed is Dubai's ruler, but he's also its CEO and, and is also highly developed in many of the big, uh, uh, sorry, it's highly important, instrumental in the running of many of those huge master developers. Um, so that's the context within which development is delivered in Dubai. Um, there's a lot going on in Dubai and it's a, it can leave your head scratching a bit because the, the overall legibility is often lacking, but it's a fascinating diagram. But generally, I would say um, the model of development in Dubai is that of many cities. So Amale Andreos refers to Dubai as a archipelago, it's as island urbanism. It's an archipelago of islands. So you have all these what are called mini cities. I bring up Dubai Internet City, Media City, Festival City, Healthcare City, International City, and the list goes on. So what happens is you get these huge mega developers going in, delivering huge projects on a vast scale. They love big sites because they work at a big scale. They don't want to muck around with small sites. You know, I mean, the Palms are an excellent example of that, easily visible from space, huge mega structures, you know, wonder of the world kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, even Dubai Media and Internet City, these are not small projects. Um, Business Bay, this huge project here is, is, you know, is vast. You know, the kind of things that in, in the West would be um, cities in themselves become these mini cities, right? So the, the city is a kind of system of islands which is strung together with a minimum of kind of infrastructure. And the islands often are kind of worlds unto themselves. And culturally, it kind of works because um, the metaphor for Dubai is one of, um, it's a salad bowl. So it's not a melting pot. In the West, we gen generally think of cultural assimilation and that our societies are melting pots where everyone kind of melts, melts in together and fits together and we all muck in. In Dubai, the model has been referred to by Cool House and others as the salad bowl, which is... Different cultures and, and socioeconomic strata just rub up against each other, but they're kind of different. They don't really meld that much. At least that's in many instances. And so the division of the city into these kind of islands often relate to um, a certain socioeconomic strata or a certain culture. Um, so there's a kind of, there is some expectation of where the Western expatriates might live and where the Emiratis live. And, well, definitely where the unskilled migrant labourers live because they live on the edge of the city in labour camps generally uh, or, or 20 people to a room in, in Bur Dubai, which is the old areas around here. Anyway, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's about island urbanism, huge development site, huge developers, uh, all very, very much connected to that of the ruling family and its interests. Um, so, so, you know, like, we, obviously we, we've done our theories like New Urbanism where Andre Duani has cooked up a theory and, and, you know, it's top down and then it's applied in projects. This analysis of Dubai, probably less insightful, but will follow a similar method to that of learning from Las Vegas, Denise Scott Brown, Stephen Isenher and Robert Venturi, where they went to Vegas and then tried to discern from it what the core principles were. I'll try and do that a bit with Dubai in terms of just taking you through some of the projects and talking about um, what the projects are doing, what, the, what they're saying. Because, call it a theory or otherwise, Dubaiification is now being deployed across the world, so it's quite significant to understand it. Okay, so let's just jump into the urbanisms. Um, this one is probably the foremost urbanism. I've, I've shown images of this in other lectures. This is a Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid garden. This was an original proposal for this huge site, which is sort of the middle of Dubai, south of all the development along the coast. Um, and it essentially was going to be a huge housing project for around a quarter of a million people for UA citizens. This was in 2008. It was designed um, by Eric Kuhn and Associates and very much the Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Gardens project, as that might hint. It was very much a pet project of Sheikh Mohammed. 
Um, so 73% of it was going to be green landscape. It was going to house a quarter of a million people. So that's just a bit more than Canberra. It's taken 100 years to get Canberra to that point. Uh, it was going to have a university campus and the largest, largest park system in the Middle East in over 10,000 years. So it's about this, you know, um, positioning this project within the lineage of grand visions, Hausmann's Paris, for instance, being one reference point. Um, and so it's very much about flattering the ego of Sheikh Mohammed. But, you know, like these kind of projects in this context um, are hugely powerful. I mean, I guess from the West, you look at that and go, it looks a bit green and blue and it's nice. And, you know, it's kind of medium density perimeter blocks, uh, quite civic looking. It's a bit city beautiful. But in the context of a hyper-arid uh, biophysical context and the context of uh, Bedouin culture where just, you know, a slight green tinge in the desert indicated it had rained there two years previously and therefore there'd be more food for the camels. This is a huge project in terms of socio-political legitimization of the sheikh and his benevolent dictatorship. He is expressing how powerful he is here. I can turn the desert green. I can turn it into a paradise. So this is a, an act of great power. Um, you know, he's doing a houseman, basically, isn't he? He's doing a Napoleon. Uh, and Eric Kuhn, I guess, was his houseman. Um, but it's about more than that in this context. It has a kind of religious underpinning. Uh, you're, you're kind of creating paradise on earth in a way. The Quran talks about paradise as being... Um, it's a, it's a beautiful garden, and that's what's being created here, and, and he's creating that on earth, and that, that, that reveals his strength, his power, but there's a certain, and with that, there's a certain socio-political legitimization what's going on. So this project was designed, it crashed and burned with the, um, with the uh, GFC, I think it was, and, and then emerged a few years later as a Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid city, watered down a bit. So there was a humbling that went with the JFC. Um, Dubai had to be bailed out by Abu Dhabi to finish um, uh, uh, the Burj Khalifa, which is the now tallest building in the world, which pre Burj uh, Khalifa was the, um, was the sheikh of Abu Dhabi. So, you know, there's a loss of faith that went on there uh, when Dubai hit the JFC and there were, you know, a lot of projects cancelled. But the project was reborn in, let's call it a more modest phase here uh, with this huge seven kilometer meter seven kilometer crystal lagoon so we're talking again it's mega projects mega developers a huge kind of suburban development but also with towers an indoor ski field but let's go back to the crystal lagoon this is essentially a swimming pool right um, this is in a place where there's no water you have to desalinate water right the, a lot of the the planting would be watered with treated sewage effluent but presumably the crystal lagoon is coming from uh, Treated, you know, is desalinated water. Uh, so huge evaporative losses, huge amount of water used, huge amount of resources to make that. Um, but, you know, so this is about luxury. And we talked about island urbanism where uh, developments are kind of ostracizing the world. You know, they turn their back on the world around it. And this is that kind of thing. And you can see it. There's not a lot of roads entering and exiting this. There's controlled access points. And this is about... You know, it's called paradisical urbanism. It's about a paradise for those people who can afford it to escape the dusty, dry reality of Dubai, which is pretty hard work, it has to be said. Um, so this is about luxury, a cornucopia of green and blue for those who can afford it. And we can see more images of that there zooming in. It's not just the huge crystal lagoon, but the housing is just dripping in green space. And, you know, in Dubai, this has huge environmental implications. Zooming, dropping, starting to drop down into this weird kind of reality of of this crystal lagoon, and this is a photo I took uh, quite a few years ago now um, of, of that taking shape. And here we can, you know, you know, you can get to imagine the scale of it. Um, and you know, talking about this thing about cultural, um, the cultural islands that start forming in Dubai. I went to the sail center, and and perhaps. Um, this is not ethical, but I pretended I was possibly thinking of buying a house. And, um, and they convinced me that while there would be certain people in there uh, of different cultures, which you know I might not find that appealing, they would only be the rich people from those cultures, so it would be okay. So, you know, it's very much a sorting. And we see this kind of same dynamic, maybe to less extremes. This is um, Dubai Hills development on the edge of Dubai, so it's a big golf course. 
you know, and um, golf is huge in Dubai, but again, look at the green space, look at the density, uh, look at its, um, you know, you know, its separation from the world around it. Again, another luxury project where you get to escape the city. But, you know, it's wrestled into being outside of these, you know, it is a desert. And you, when you go to the sites, um, those mega developers work on a scale where the, 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 there's, no, there's no remnant structure of, of, of that original biophysical setting left by the time it's developed. It's completely reconstituted. And it's kind of as, as, as artificial, you know, as a slice of portion of the moon would be re relative to that um, existing biophysical desert setting. And, you know, all of these um, projects, these paradisical kind of projects, they need to be separated from the rest of Dubai to maintain their, their luxury, uh, their extravagance, and so you get this kind of, um, they're secured perimeters, all fenced uh, and with, with security. So they become their own little worlds. Fascinating worlds as they are. Spectacular urbanism is the second one. So this is a pretty modest looking building. This is the main road of Dubai, Sheikh Zayed Road, you can see here, disappearing. Um, so that road now has, has a forest of towers along it, which we'll see in later images. But in 1979, I think it was, Dubai built um, the, world, uh, the Middle East's tallest building, which is the World Trade Centre. And um, Queen Elizabeth was flying back from Bahrain to London, and she re redirected her flight to look at it because it was quite, a, quite iconic in those times, you know. Um, there wasn't much around and, and quite an achievement, you know. Um, and it, in, the, in, the, in the minds of the, of the sheikh of the time, it kind of brought home this idea that build it and they will come. We can construct attractions. We can put ourselves on the map by building things. You know, I guess there was a general perception that there was nothing really there. Well, that wasn't quite true. It was a pretty intricate little village, port town or port city on the, on the creek. But, you know, it was generally otherwise a bit thin on the ground for attractions. But this idea that you could construct attractions was huge and, and important. And, you know, fast forward like 30 years or 40 years, and you have this. This was probably the most extreme of the plans for Dubai by Nikhil. Okay, so big mega developer. They were doing a lot of the offshore developments. Uh, huge, um, this is the Palm Jumeirah, which got built. Palm Jewel Ali, which has been built. This huge waterfront project, which I think has been scaled back. And the Dera Palm, which has also been scaled back. The world will get into that. That was partly developed. But, you know, this is this idea of constructing attractions. But now they're doing it from the perspective of Google Earth, right? Um, so, you know, you're branding Dubai from that huge, you know, such as the scale of the project, you're branding it from the, the purview of, of the satellite. And it's about putting it on the map. And it is this idea we can, can build attractions and people will come. And it works. You know, the, the West might ridicule some of this stuff and talk about its terrible environmental implications and the destroyed coral reefs and problems with longshore flow and erosion of beaches. But, you know, they put it on the map and you get the world talking about it and the world goes there. I mean, it doesn't hurt that you have the um, Emirates airline pumping through there too. But, you know, these projects have put Dubai on the map and there's a direct connection to now what you see with Neon. Um, but big mega projects, right? Okay, so this is spectacular urbanism. Logos. Logoscapes, you could call them. So they're logos that you live in, um, which is curious. So the areas you live in, like the palm here, are not necessarily designed to be lived in. It's a logo. Uh, the Sheikh Mohammed is a keen helicopter pilot, apparently. Um, and there were uh, words of poetry that he'd written, which was written in little graphics in the water. The palm tree is hugely significant in that region. Um, the date palm tree, so no wonder that was chosen. But it was also about co coastal multiplication, which is, see, what you want to do is develop as much coastal land as you possibly can, as much linear coastal edge, right, because where you have access to the coast, it, you can charge more money. And so what they've done is to increase the length of Dubai's coastline by hundreds of percent by building these projects where a huge coastline is wrapped right through them. And you, it uplifts the value of all that property. You know, and they're you know, staggering, sublime, quite beautiful things from a certain perspective. But when you zoom in, it starts to fall to bits a bit. Like, you know, okay, you've got the beach, but um, there's a sort of repetition in it that becomes monotonous, frond A, B and C. And then you have these problems. Like this is a view going on to, I think it was the Jumeirah palm. 
And you have this knot of a freeway infrastructure which bridges over onto the trunk of the island. You know, is it walkable? No. But the problem is all of the transport for all of those dwellings has to funnel through this narrow neck of land to the mainland. And so it becomes vehicular dominated, you know. And then, you know, this is along the trunk. Well, it might be nice in terms of how they interface with the, the water, but, you know, it's a terrible kind of streetscape. Uh, typical Dubai where, you know, these buildings are only 100 metres apart, but you can't walk between them. Uh, you've got to get in a taxi and drive up the road and go over f a freeway junction and come back on the other side, you know. So, you know, um, the logos are sublime and kind of hugely powerful, but problematic on the ground. This is the, um, the world development, which has been a failure. For a long time, the only one that was developed was G20, or which was Greenland. And I think the Sheikh had a a little house on there. There were plenty of proposals with what would happen to the other ones. But they had a lot of trouble with them silting up between the islands. And um, I digress a bit, but this, you get sea snakes in Dubai and they love hot water and they love the, the shallow areas of water between the islands, which would get super hot. And, and I had friends who would, I used to windsurf out through it, but I had friends who would paraglide out there and drop the kite and then pull it up and snakes would fall off it, you know. Um, look, that's not a scientific study, but evidently there was a bit of a problem. Also, they had trouble just securing the edges of them. Um, and so, you know, there were problems with erosion and subsidence and different things. So I guess it preempts climate change to some degree. Uh, I went out there when I was working in Dubai, which I should say was 2005 to 2008. This is the one that had been developed. And it was a weird and kind of wonderful but very strange landscape. You know, but that's what you can do when you have a... A benevolent dictator who who controls both state, uh, you know, um, business and and public and private interests. There's no controls on this kind of stuff happening, you know. So spectacular urbanism. Well, it's not quite urbanism, but you know, it's certainly spectacular. So those projects brand Dubai from looking down, um, but Dubai's logo skyline, as it's being called, is also another key thing of putting Dubai on the map. So going back to the World Trade Center, which um, Queen Elizabeth redirected her flight for in 1979. Well, you know, is this one of the, is this obviously one of the most distinctive skylines in the world? It puts Dubai on the map and you know where its center is, you know, the world's tallest building. Um, and, you know, it's, it's when you drive to Dubai outside of the desert and you see this rearing up out of the desert kind of dust and sand and mists, it's, it's stunning stuff. Uh, 880 metres tall. I watched it being built from the end of my street. It would go up about a floor a week. Again, sitting in a huge swimming pool. Um, and we have sort of strange traditional takes on it or, or sort of pastiches of traditional Arabic Islamic architecture here in the foreground. So it's, it's a bit discontiguous. But, you know, these are the mega projects, mall of the world here, biggest mall in the world. Everything's got to be the bigger. It's all about biggest. It's all about superlatives. You know, the biggest mall, the tallest building, the biggest pool, the biggest park, you know. Uh, it's led people to accuse Dubai of being a bit like a teenager um, that, that needs to constantly jump in front of the camera and assert itself. Um, but, you know, it falls apart on the ground. So this is that, we saw that dusty, dry road with the World Trade Center on it. Um, so that's what that's become. But, you know, these tall buildings... Um, don't necessarily deliver a, a, an interesting urbanism on the ground. You tend to need large roads and car parks and everything to deal with um, all the people which are moving in and out of those buildings, you know. And Shakeside Road has become a monster, uh, some 14 lane, lanes wide or something. So, you know, it's car madness to, to an extreme degree. Car culture, um, you know, falls apart. So at the same time as we have this kind of logo urbanism you know this huge let's put it on the map kind of thing there is a kind of nostalgia too to some development in dubai such as you see in madinat jamira which is this project here another effectively mega project mixed use lots of residential hotels restaurants bars cafes shopping um, but has all been developed as a pastiche of traditional arabic islamic architecture uh, how do you know that well it's the kind of this sort of rendered walls it is the wind these fake wind towers which is how um, hot air used to be expelled and cool air drawn into traditional urban compositions. The abras, which are the traditional boats which ply the creek, which is the main waterway of Dubai, which is a, sort of like an estuary. Uh, so you get, re you know, and the use of the date palms. Uh, so it's kind of, 
it evokes but doesn't directly um, reflect traditional Arabic Islamic architecture of the region. Um, and what, but why would you do this? Well, a couple of reasons. It's good for tourists. Tourists love it because they want an authentic experience. And for a lot of them, it's not enough now to just, I just, just seeing the tallest building in the world is kind of too easy. They want to have an experience of a souk, which is a traditional Arabic market. They, they want to smoke a shisha and go in an abra, but then don't necessarily want to deal with the hassle of the old town, which is cacophonous, you know. They want to do it in a more controlled environment, and this gives them that opportunity. But it's also because of this. In Dubai, 80% of the population is expatriates, or you could call them immigrants, right? 20% are locals, and the locals have been, you know, broadly supportive, and certainly in the Arab Spring there was no major uprisings that I'm aware of in, in Dubai or, or the Gulf states, mostly. But, um, you know, for a lot of Emiratis, my sense is there's a sense that... Um, They've had the city sold out from under them. Uh, and they've lost the quiet, more traditional town or city of their youth, you know. Um, so this, this bid to recreate uh, Arabic Islamic urbanism, pastiche as it may be, is also a play, I think, by Sheikh Mohammed to those people who feel estranged from this relentless development and, and the you know, spectacular urbanism that you're seeing at the mega projects. Um, so this is a countercurrent to all that and I think appeals to them, you know, and it's, it's not unpleasant. I had many happy nights at Madad at Jamira, you know, and they're souks and things. So souks is a tr traditional Arabic Islamic market. They look something like this, but they're a lot more cacophonous and a lot more interesting, but this is a, done a bloody good job of recreating one. So this is a kind of tourist souk in Madan at Jamira. But you know, when we zoom out, you see, um, how much the project, you know, and you can hear, see some of this traditional Arabic Islamic kind of urbanism here. You know, it's estranged from from huge road road networks, which are anything if not um, impositions and Western impositions of freeways into you know into this into this land and this urbanism. So you know, it becomes an island of difference, an island of nostalgia, but it's nestled within a in a contradictory kind of setting, and you know. Funnily enough, under Madinat Jamira, when you get down underneath it all, well, it's all structured car parking and services and everything. So it's a kind of theme park, you know. Uh, it's anything but traditional, but, you know, it's, it's magnificent. Other projects like Al Sif, which is, this is along Dubai Creek, which you would have seen in that tourist image of Dubai, um, which is the old waterway within, uh, upon which the old port and the old souks were. But this is old. So this, this sorry, this is new. It looks old. But it's, it's quite new. This has developed in the last um, seven or eight years, I think. Um, you know, and you can see you can see the security guards. So security is endlessly present in Dubai in the more wealthy areas, and it's to maintain them as, as spaces of, of consumption, of leisure, um, you know, and, and to kind of quarantine them, and often to keep out the, the kind of unskilled migrant workers who take away from this ostentatious kind of image of consumption um, you know we find we find funny images like this so this is this apparently old area with you know assortments of old fishing nets and things and we have a, a no doubt migrant laborer here scrubbing scrubbing the the paving which has been made to look all dusty and dirty and how he's out there cleaning it you know so you, you, it becomes quite strange culture village here this is another project on the creek and again you know, this kind of pastiche of traditional styles, the vernacular, uh, sort of interpretations of wind towers. And it's called Culture Village, but this is where they used to build dows along the, along the creek. So, you know, a site of probably true culture and tradition of timber boat building, beautiful boats, is sacrificed to urban development. And this is largely because Dubai has run out of oil and one of now its major um, earners is, is real estate, you know. But it's not just about... Um, serving up a pastiche of historic Arabic Islamic urbanisms, you know, it's anything's go, you know, you can, you can, you can invent anything here. And that's the freedom of Dubai. It's one of the kind of wonderful and weird things about it. So we have a kind of traditional take on, I don't know if it's Paris or, or London here in Dubai city walk, you know? Um, so there's, we're moving away from, from, I think the superlative focus of the tallest building or the biggest park or the biggest pool or whatever it is to actually Dubai going, we, we know we need to deliver something more sophisticated than that. We need to deliver an enriching experience. 
So it's about urbanity and, and creating these, these more urban um, master plan projects where you can walk through, you can have a meal, uh, you can um, watch the passing parade of people, which is fascinating in Dubai because you know, everyone dresses so differently in such an assortment of cultures. You know? And you even get fake sort of Banksy, Banksy um, graffiti. I should note, however, that these are highly controlled environments, more security in the foreground there. He just told off a couple of school kids who were trying to get people to fill in a survey. Um, and if you go around, if, if Banksy really did come here and unauthorised and started doing these kind of artworks, you know, you'd, be, you'd be getting fined. Um, so it's about the image of urbanity, but not the re reality of the kind of random encounters of true urbanity. It is a kind of stage set. Fascinating one too, and you even get projects that kind of invent. Um, you know, here we have it's inventing a post-industrial aesthetic of an old uh, port sort of railway line that never existed. You know, um, so you know there's a kind of kind of theming that's going on with those urbane projects, but there's more generally just some fascinating kind of theme parks that go on. So this was vast. This was a project called Dubai Land which was a vast mega project for a mega theme park on the edge of, on the edge of Dubai. I mean, look at this thing. It's, um, it's obviously turning its back on reality completely. If you imagine that this is all currently a desert, uh, you know, it becomes just draped in, in a cornucopia of green, greenery and water, hotels, golf courses, conference centres, theme parks. So it's the idea that uh, the theme park can become the city. And that Dubai, is, the biophysical landscape is just a kind of tab tabula rasa, or at best it's a sandpit that can be just reshaped according to economic pr prerogatives and designers' visions. These are typically done from people not from Dubai, uh, who may live in Dubai, but from people from outside who might not have a strong connection to place or culture. And this is about creating you know, a theme park which can draw in the global tourist and trap them and their money for as long as possible. And, and why not, you know? And then you get into a weird situation in Dubai land where you have a theme park of a theme park. So these are Dubai buildings, which are then represented as a kind of cartoon within a theme park in Dubai of, of Dubai, which is a kind of theme park. Um, so confusing and head scratching kind of stuff. But you know that the climate and the site is real. As much as it's stomped on and tries to be you know, hidden, it is real, and we could see the du Dubai Land Sail Centre back in 2008 or so. Um, don't have a space shuttle, just invent one, that's fine. Uh, this had lions and tigers within it, fake volcano, a, a, you know, fake roll, um, roller coaster, totally weird stuff. And the liberation of design from context is kind of fascinating, but it's kind of worrying too. And when you actually get down on the ground and get beyond the models and the renders, the disjunction is truly weird. Um, we can see the kind of site it was being dropped into here. You know, it's a real site. Um, so Dubai is not uh, uh, immune to stinging critiques from people like me, and I've made a few over the years. Not, not that anyone reads your PhD, but I ended up turning that into a book. Um, but anyway, you know, like there's a lot of people who heap um, critique on Dubai and scorn. People like Mike Davis, who wrote Fear and Loathing in Dubai, I think it was, who, who really just point out the environmental and social costs with the model of development. And so, you know, the Sheikh, I think, is not impervious to such criticisms and observations. And as Dubai tries to mature into something more authentic and more sustainable, there's been a focus on sustainable urbanism. And a lot of the dynamics can be understood in how the different emirates relate to each other. So Abu Dhabi, which is where Mazdar City is under construction, which is the world attempted a, the world's first carbon neutral city, has its problems. But they're a centre of tradition and culture and Dubai is seen as the brash upstart, which is all about money and glamour and being ostentatious. So when you have Abu Dhabi delivering this shining new city, you know, you get this concomitant effect in Dubai where they go, well, we can do that too. And so they develop Sustainable City, which is a fascinating project on the edge of Dubai, has a green spine with these weird kind of um, buildings where you can grow food it's medium density with lots of solar panels. You park your car here and then you get in a little golf court with a little man and he'll drive you to your house. Um, so this is quite radical for Dubai in that it's not completely car dependent. At least once you get it, you've got to drive a car to get there. You're tempted to grow some food. There is some greenery. 
you have things like ducks and chickens. It's, it's all quite surreal, but quite wonderful too. And, you know, it's sort of kind of, it feels like a bit of a low-tech Mazda city. And they certainly developed it. Like it, it's, I think the speed of development has been much quicker than Dubai, you know. Uh, it's not without its amenities, pools and, you know, lovely roof terraces. There's a bit of a nod, I guess, to traditional Arabic Islamic urbanism going on here with the roof terrace, the flat habitable roof terrace, which is a great thing. You know, getting down onto the ground and we can see these golf, they're not streets, they're, they're walkways for the golf carts and we can see the golf carts there. And then you get inside these kind of things and, um, you know, it, it starts to get a little bit strange. Um, but certainly if you want to really grow things in Dubai, I guess that's how you have to do it. And certainly most agriculture in that context needs to be internal. And we can see again the obligatory wind tower here rendered in a more contemporary style in the town square. Um, so, you know, there, there's this kind of push for sustainability. This is a long cancelled project, but it's really fascinating in the sense of, you know, if you took a big project in Dubai and tried to reconcile it with the development, what would it look like? So this was by SMAC and X Architects. Uh, it's called Zervatown. It got cancelled, I think, after the GFC. But um, they actually measured humidity within the desert dune system and then went, well, let's locate green spaces and buildings within, nestle them within those more humid zones. Let's design it for ventilation so the prevailing winds are funneled through it. Let's build courtyard dwellings so that you have these private green kind of courtyards where you're protected from the world around, you know lots of shade structures, buildings over the road, so you get a lot of shading. You know, these things are kind of, you know, it's an expression of actually respecting the culture to some degree, but particularly the climate and the biophysical setting. Okay, so the critique then. Um, I don't intend to add to the pile, substantial pile of literature that authors have skewed towards denunciation in Dubai, which generally goes under the term Dubai bashing. But then again, this model is being exported all over North Africa and the world, and we'll talk about that. So, you know, it's worth asking the degree to which it's kind of delivering on prevailing social, environmental, or cultural goals, you know, uh, that we would aspire to in our planning. And I think just to go back to the, the biophysical dimension, this is a gaff woodland. So gaff trees, you can see here, um, they are beautiful trees and they have huge deep tap roots which go right down to where there's water, sometimes I believe 40 metres deep. So it's a thin ecosystem, but you know, you have the Arabian fox and the desert hare and there's, you know, like they're birds and different things which live within these gaff woodlands. So it's not just a sand pit, that often gets overlooked. Dubai has destroyed a lot of this stuff. There's a couple of kind of parks which preserve it, which are worth a look. Uh, at to get a sense of what it did look like. But when you have a big mega project and you're rolling out a huge project on the end of the Dubai, this stuff very quickly um, uh, is rolled under a D9 bulldozer, you know. So we lose that, that, that biophysical landscape, which is hugely important to the culture, but also has some biophysical, biological biodiversity significance, you know. When we do develop it, which is typically done, you know, in a way where you're producing a, a landscape which for the local flora and fauna is kind of, it's just completely sterile. Uh, as Boris Jensen says, it's stranger to the prevailing biophysical landscape than a portion of the moon would be, you know, and it requires a huge amount of water. So grass in Dubai in summer, uh, one square metre requires about 18 litres of water. So take something like this, you start to get a feel for what that's going to require. Now, some of it's treated sewage effluents are fine. Maybe it wasn't going to be drunk anyway, but nonetheless, that water could have been used for uh, agriculture or something. And, you know, presumably huge fertiliser requirements as well. And it conflicts with the existing desert ecosystems. Okay, other thing is, you know, working in Dubai, um, if you're working as an urban designer, an architect or a landscape architect, these guys will be building your projects uh, working in terrible conditions in summer, 50 degree heat. You go and do a site visit for half an hour and you collapse into your car and you have to sit there in the aircon for 20 minutes just to try and gather yourself so you can move. And these guys are out in an all day. You can't underrate just how hot it is. That's actually an image of Doha, but the point remains. Um, and then are generally bust back to um, workers' accommodation on the fringe. So the city is for them to build, it's not for them to inhabit. A lot of spaces are privatised um, and not just, 
you know, it's like the shopping malls. You know, you, a lot of these guys are not welcome in the upmarket shopping malls. Uh, parks are often fenced. Um, you know, um, extravagant housing estates are definitely um, fenced. So these guys, the houses, the building is for them to, the city is not for them to inhabit, it's for them to build. But they do so under often terrible conditions. Uh, and, you know, that, that's, that poses ethical issues, you know. And so, you know, here we are, we can see them trying to get some shade in what is probably a short lunch hour, uh, you know, in a, in a traffic median, but being moved on by the police, you know. So, um, you know, not an easy life for them. The other thing in Dubai is we're finding that, you know, a lot of the spaces which were open and free and genuinely kind of had this kind of intermingling of different cultures and random encounters. This was referred to the Russian beach. This is what it used to look like in 2005. They've been redeveloped as upmarket kind of, um, you know, complexes for experts, uh, expatriates and wealthy locals to go and dine. And they're not without their charms. I must say it's really nice. But you're, you're losing the kind of wild, um, the wilder kind of, uh, chance encounters that you'd get on the Russian beach with this weird mix of Russian tourists and Pakistani workers and expat, you know, Western expatriates and even a few Emiratis in, in the night and the evening walking along the beach. You know, it's, it's then reformulated as a destination for consumption, you know. Okay, and in that context, um, you know, obviously there's issues there around, I think, the environmental problems the societal problems and also i think the existing culture is being you know kind of trivialized by these these pastiches of of emirati traditional arabic islamic urbanism uh, which kind of confuse and are, are really more theme parks than anything but the model's being exported all around the world because it's seen as being a um a wealth generating model you can generate huge amount of tourism and investment through these mega projects you know so we see it spreading to Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Kuwait, Qatar, further afield, China, India, Africa, Jordan, Tunisia, Morocco, Syria, Turkey, Brazil, Baku, South Korea, Hong Kong, Azerbaijan, and Lebanon. Uh, this is the Lebanese example of the cedar tree, which is um, the... This is cancelled, you'll be glad to hear, but, you know, probably taking it a step too far. But, you know, um, the Dubai model, development model, is, is viewed, you know, as being one of real wealth and revenue generation. And you can understand why, because if you're a, if you're a young Saudi person who's growing up in, in Riyadh, you know, you look at Dubai and the freedoms that it offers. Uh, it's a bit like, you know, like the Americans have Vegas and the Australians have Bali. For the Saudis, my understanding is Dubai is like that. What happens in Dubai stays in Dubai. There's a, there's a freedom which goes with it. Uh, if you're from Syria, or you're, you know, you can come here and you can open a business um, in some which which is peaceful uh, and secure, and you can speak Arabic and you can run a business in Arabic, um, and you can export it, or, you know, to other places. But it's this kind of um, it's a dreamscape, I guess, you know. And I think that's why the model's being exported so much. But it's also because you know huge developers like Emar from Dubai, which are, you know government-backed developers, you know they then can work at a scale which is of appeal to, you know, um, El Sisi, the ruler of Egypt, for instance, you know. So we see that. Um, so this is the new administrative capital city being built on the edge of um, Cairo. Rob Cameron and I have uh, written a paper on that, which got published a while back. You can read about the problems of that. Now, um, Dubai developers were at one point involved in this. I think it's the Chinese are building it now. But, you know, you can see the model of, you know, it's got a huge park. It's the world's biggest park and all that. Eight times as big as Central Park or something. Um, you know, monumental kind of architecture, a little bit like the Sheikh Mohammed bin, Raden, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Gardens project. Um, you know, and then the kind, of, the kind of power of it, the iconic quality of it. You know, I think speaking to Dubai, but also speaking more broadly to the city, beautiful. But again, it's this epic mega project. It's hard to think that the Dubai model didn't have an impact on it. Other new developments on the edge of Cairo, and again, we can see this, this kind of paradisical landscape of rolling the cornucopia of water and greenery and luxury houses, all behind a secure fence is very much Dubai. And neon, you know, that idea, build it and they will come, construct attractions. And it doesn't matter that people say neon's so stupid and everyone's, you know, putting their boot into it in the Western media. 
you're talking about it and it's reshaping the image of Saudi Arabia. And, you know, well, you know, if they build it, I'll go look at it. And I'm sure many other people will too. So this idea that you can construct attractions remains. And really, although this doesn't look like anything that's been proposed in Dubai, to my knowledge, it's still in that mode of operating, of constructing attractions, build it and they will come. And it's also about, you know, again, the kind of environmental costs that, that go with development in Dubai and also the running roughshod over the local people. Uh, so people who, who resisted this development, uh, you know, this might have been their native, their traditional lands have certainly um, fallen foul of the law uh, and are in prison or facing even worse, worse punishments, I believe. I don't know. So, you know, issues there. Um, the Dubai model even washes up in pla weird places like Perth. Dubai on the Swan, which was the scheme for um, uh, Elizabeth Key in 2008 that was tagged Dubai on the Swan and never really recovered because there was a lot of local backlash against that. And even, um, just as an aside, uh, Sheikh Mohammed wants to build a new the first city on Mars by 2117. So UAE en engineers are working on a concept city about the size of Chicago. So, you know, it's being exported all over the place. Um, to whatever effect, I'm not sure. Um, okay, so look, yeah, I mean, this lecture, it's a little bit different to the others, but it really is about that idea of, you know, there's a kind of emerging theory from Dubai, which is about um, the confluence of public and private, mega projects, mega developers, running roughshod over the, the site, the landscape, the culture, workers' rights to produce glamorous projects which put you on the map, which then fuel investment and improve your economy. Uh, they are places for inhabitation, generally by which, rich people, um, and, and they are places which are becoming sites for conspicuous consumption. This is not about the chance encounter you typically get in more authentic Arabic cities. Um, you know, and I was part of it. So this is me in 2008 with a very bad haircut. I don't know quite what I'm doing, but this was a huge development on the edge of, the, of Dubai called Dubai Silicon Oasis. Um, and we were turning the desert green and doing all the things which I've critiqued. Uh, I wrote a book about it, which was my sense to make sense of it. Uh, it's, not, it's mostly about the landscapes of Dubai's urban model. It was a, this was my PhD was landscape architectural and focused, but you might find of interest. Thanks for listening.